Thank you for that, and praise team for your beautiful singing. And good morning, Azure Hills. It is so good to be here with you. I can't tell you how long Max and Andrea and I have been dreaming about this moment well before we arrived here a few weeks ago. And we settled in quite nicely. And we took care of all the essentials. You know, we unpacked, got the internet up and running. We went to the DMV no less than three times, three hours long each time, so we could get the California driver's license. I went to the beach. We got a sunburn. Unrelated to the sunburn, I had a fun nine-hour uh, visit to the emergency room. That was not the way I was expecting to meet Loma Linda University Hospital. But we made it through all of that, and here we are with you. I want to uh, thank my family for traveling uh, to be with us. Uh, later on in the second service, um, we'll meet my sister, my brothers-in-law, my father-in-law. Um, and we're really happy that they are here with us. More of our family uh, is going to be visiting in the months to come, and we look forward to their visiting as well. But as I begin, I want to thank Pastor Tara and the pastoral team here at Azure Hills. I want to thank the Azure Hills Search Committee, the church board, as well as the Southeastern California Conference for seeing God's leading and extending the call to the family to join here in this community. When Pastor Tara first called with the inquiry, I was honored at being considered, but in my mind, there was absolutely no way I was going to move from Washington, D.C. area here to California. We were tied in so nicely there. Andrea just established her business as a clinical psychologist, and by the way, she's far brighter and much more interesting to talk to than me. As you get to know her, you will say, yeah, I remember you said that at the first uh, time you were here. You're right, Pastor. Uh, Max was doing so well in his school, and he was an all-star in his soccer league. We had just bought a house that we loved a few years back. We were all set. So coming to California was going to be nice for us to do as a vacation, but not as a move. So when Pastor Tara called, I didn't think there was a chance. Nevertheless, she persisted. Pastor Daniel, it sounds as if you're doing a wonderful ministry there, but our team has been praying, and we want to know if you will join us in prayer. She had to ask that, right? Andrea and I started praying. Two months later, we came out, met with uh, the pastors, the search committee, and then incognito, we were here at a church service. It was actually Pastor George's installation, and we were warmly welcomed by many of you, uh, not knowing who we were or why we were here. You were just being your normal, loving selves, which was so nice, and God started to speak. On the flight home, I was getting a little nervous. Things went well on our trip. Too well. So well that Andrea and I started to sense God's calling. He wanted us to move. The only problem was that I didn't really want to move yet. So we kept praying. And every few days or so, when I was deep in thought and reflection about what God would have us do, I would get a text from Pastor Tara. Good morning. We're thinking and praying for you. Hello, our committee just met, and we're asking for God's peace on you and your family. Hi, I just wanted to let you know that you have great support here from Azure Hills. This would happen almost every single time I would be in prayer about what to do. 
And I was like, God, okay, I hear you. I hear you, Lord. But it wasn't just prayer. I had a tangible list. I'm a list kind of guy. And I had a tangible list that I said, God, I need help with this list. What about the Tacoma Park Church? You know I'm tied in so intricately into the operations. And I, God said, I have that covered. Well, what about Andrea's practice? And God said, she can move her practice. Well, what about Max's school? And Max just would spontaneously say, oh, Dad, I really loved how we visited that big school when we were over in California. Well, what about our house, Lord? How about that? And he's like, oh, I'll just sell it in a couple of days for you. Most of the times when I pray, I don't get a clear yes or no. That's just a fact. Usually what happens when I pray is that God tells me something vague, like think about all of the options before you and use the brain that I gave you. Do what you think is best. And in those moments, I could get frustrated, wishing that God would just crystal clear say yes or no. This is what you have to do. But in the case of Azure Hills Church, he did. He was crystal clear with Andrea and with I. And so there is no doubt that we believe we should be here. And that's exciting for us. Yes. That is so exciting because I know he's going to do great things here. And now that we're here and see some, not even all, we just see some of the goodness that God was leading us to, I can hardly believe how hesitant I was at coming in the first place. And that's so true to life, isn't it? When we fight with God and something happens, it doesn't go our way, it doesn't fulfill our expectations. And all the while, God is saying, I want to give you more than you could even think or imagine. Just trust me. If you could relate to this, you don't have to feel bad because God gets us. He is patient and gracious with us. He has had thousands of years of practice, people just like us resisting, who don't get it. And we're going to see that actually in today's scripture. But before we do that, can I please ask you to bow your heads one more time as we start with one quick word of prayer. Lord, thank you so much for this very moment Thank you for what you are about to do, what you have already been doing in this community, and just for allowing us to join. As we open your word today, we ask for you to speak to our hearts, and we ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So I also found it playfully ironic when Pastor Tara told me that the church had been studying the book of Mark this summer in a series titled God of Miracles. And that on the week I would be installed, we would be up to Mark chapter 11, the triumphal entry. <laughs> well, what a wonderful way for me to make my entry here to Azure Hills than to talk about the triumphal entry of the one who saves us from the mess we are in, Jesus Christ. Our scripture reading today was taken from Mark chapter 11, uh, verses 7 through 11. I just want to read it one more time uh, with you. Uh, verse 7 starts, When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And interestingly, we read, Jesus entered Jerusalem, went into the temple courts, 
looked around at everything, but since it was late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. He's here. He's finally here. Jesus, the one who is going to save us. That's what the crowd was thinking. To me, that brings to mind an image of the Olympics. They just finished this past Sunday. Were you able to follow any of the stories? Some of my favorite stories were when gymnast Simone Biles, I have a photo uh, of the gymnast Simone Biles and Jordan Childs. And they showed the world the beauty of sharing power instead of hoarding it. When they blessed and honored their competitor, Rebecca Andrande, and lightheartedly bowed to her. That was such a beautiful moment. I also love seeing Hunter Woodhall's enthusiasm for his wife Tara as she won the gold medal in the long jump. If you are having a bad day, just look up Woodhall Olympic video and you will stop having a bad day. You're welcome. And there was the phenomenon of LeBron James, Steph Curry, Kevin Durant, all on the court in the same time. We will never see such greatness on one team again. There was Suni Lee, who secretly was battling imposter syndrome, even as she was doing all these amazing feats. And she overcame, and she won several medals. Rachel Gunn from Australia, a.k.a. Ray Gunn. And her, let's say, unique interpretation of breakdance. There were so many lighthearted, heartwarming, encouraging stories. The last one I'll mention is that of Julian Alfred. She won the first ever men's or women's Olympic medal for her country, the country of St. Lucia. And when she won the women's 100-meter sprint, she beat out the heavily favored American Shikari Richardson. So how, my question is, how do you think these athletes will be received when they go home? Especially Julian, who won the first ever medal for St. Lucia. I could see that moment when she steps off that plane. There was going to be a massive homecoming, a hero's welcome. There will be a triumphal entry for her. Crowds will be gathered, people will be cheering, and flowers will be thrown at her feet. Can you see that? Well, this image gives us a small glimpse into what it must have been like when Jesus entered Jerusalem as the Messiah, the anointed one, the king from the Davidic line that would smash the chains of their oppression, restore God's glory to his children. This Jesus coming into town was a homecoming unlike any other. Jesus was riding in to save his people, except, oh my, except it didn't quite go as some planned it should. Folk were expecting one thing, and they got something else. And that happens to us all the time in life. Before we get into that, please allow me to set the stage. Jesus has had been doing what I am going to refer to as Jesus things. Can you say that? Jesus things. Jesus had been doing Jesus things for about three years. Now, Jesus things are things like feeding the hungry, healing the sick, liberating those from bondage, you know, Jesus things. As he went along doing these beautiful things, he would tell those that he was healing to not say anything about what he was doing. And when we read that, we're like, wow, Jesus, man, this is part of his thing. Why can't he just go home and shout the joyfulness and talk about what you did for him? 
But after a while, we see that when people find out what Jesus is doing and how he is blessing the widow and the orphan and how he is touching the untouchable and how he is empowering women and all these other marginalized groups, those in power start to get a little bit uncomfortable. Now, Jesus wasn't afraid of those in power. It's just that he didn't want them to mess up what he was doing. He didn't want them to get in the way of him helping the least, the last, the lost, and the lonely. But after three years of trying to keep this a secret during the triumphal entry, man, the cat is out of the bag. And as Jesus rode into Jerusalem, the crowd cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Uh, By the way, I'm very thankful for Jen sharing the story of Hosanna so that uh, little ones can know from little because I just learned relatively uh, shortly about what Hosanna meant too. And Hosanna in the highest? It's like, huh? These words weren't some sort of random, spontaneous shout of excitement. Each one of these words that the crowd was shouting were deeply rooted in ancient hopes and promises of God's children. Hosanna is taken from Psalm 118, and it's another way of saying, as Jen said, save us. Save us now. It's a way of pointing very specifically to the anointed one, to the one God's children had been waiting for, for hundreds of years. And they followed that with the one who comes in the name of the Lord. A crowd was acknowledging Jesus as the fulfillment of their hopes, of all of their messianic expectations, the one who was finally going to set them free. They were living under Roman bondage for so long. Jesus was the one who was sent by God, who was God who is going to restore the kingdom of David. You know, it's hard to equivalate anything to Jesus, but just for us to maybe get some sort of idea, it helps me at least, to think of an equivalent today would be something like if we were at a political rally and the crowd started chanting something, something that conjures up Something else, like, yes, we can, or si se puede, or something. The crowd would be expressing both an urgent desire for things to get better, and they would be saying, the one that we're chanting about, this person is the one who's going to help us get there. He's the one that's going to fulfill the promise. That's what's going on. This is kind of a rally of sorts. There were people who believed Jesus was the one sent by God, and they're crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Save us now. Everything is about to change. Thank you, God. Our nightmare is over. It was a glorious scene. And one writer put it this way, the blind whom Jesus had restored sight, they were the ones leading the way. How awesome is that to think of? The mute whose tongues Jesus made whole, they were the ones shouting the loudest Hosanna. The cripple that Jesus healed, they were the ones jumping the highest in celebration. I could imagine in my mind's eye the widow and the orphans just crying and weeping. I could see the lepers whom Jesus had cleansed spread their untainted garments now on the ground. Everyone that Jesus had touched was celebrating the coming of their king. 
And they were shouting it over and over, save us now, you're our king. Save us now, you're our king. Olympic homecoming, political rally. We are starting to build this scene. There's a modern day scene too. And not just the ones that Jesus healed. But everyone could hear what these once mute people were shouting, including the old guys in charge, the patriarchy. What do you think was going through their minds? The minds of the oppressive Roman soldiers when the crowds were shouting about the one who would come to overthrow their bondage. What what were they thinking? What do you think was going through the mind of the corrupt king, Herod, and his men as they heard the crowd call Jesus the new king? What was the immortal, immoral high priest and the Sanhedrin thinking as folks were evoking language of Old Testament messianic images describing Jesus as their true high priest? Well, I'll tell you what the patriarchy was thinking. They were thinking, we got to kill this guy. They're saying, what? A king? Oh, no. We got to put an end to this. So this homecoming, this parade, was unlike any other. Some people wanted to crown Jesus king, while other people wanted to kill him. And that's still true today. When we focus on the people that Jesus was focused on, the hungry and the marginalized, the powerless, when we give voice to the voiceless, when we give hope to the hopeless, when we start doing Jesus things, the groups that we are serving start to come alive and they rejoice and there's new life within their hearts as they receive the good news. But it's also true that when we start doing the things that we see Jesus doing, some in authority will start to plan our downfall. So this is my first day on the job, and I feel it important to share that my whole ministry is built on trying to do the things I see Jesus doing. Loving people, serving people, being relevant to their needs. You know, Jesus things. That's my ministry. That's what folks are longing for, I believe. That's what they need. There are so many Christians out there that all they do is talk. You got to do this. You can't do that. They quote verses. Or better yet, they put a pamphlet in your hand that says, you're going to hell. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Talk about God, but it supports ungodly people. Talk about God, but they're mean. They're not kind. Doesn't make sense. There are a ton of these folk out there. They are nothing like Jesus. They don't do any Jesus things. That's how I know if someone is a follower of Jesus, if they do Jesus things. If you'll feel comfortable around them. I want people to be comfortable around me, especially little kids. That's what we need more of. We need people who say they follow Jesus and then start loving and honoring and respecting and serving their neighbor, especially their neighbor that they disagree with. That's who we have to serve the most. And I've seen it time and time again when I have stepped out of my comfort zone, when I have stopped judging people and start focus on touching lives, I have seen miracles happen. I have seen hearts transformed. 
Like when we were in Charlottesville, Virginia, and a man drove his car into a crowd full of people, injuring dozens and killing one young woman. Our church went out into the community, and we experienced a miracle. We met this young woman's mother. We just met her. I had no idea who she was, but we met her there. I'll have to tell you the full story. But the Holy Spirit brought such healing that day. I'll have to tell you the story of when I was in Tacoma Park and our church board, uh, our church body, we stood in the gap of 997 low-income students. And we showed up for these kids who were being marginalized. And God moved We saw God literally change the votes of those folk who were in charge who previously voted to not give these kids money for heat or air conditioning in their school. They did a 180-degree turnaround, and they voted to allocate $6 million to build a new school. That was the work of God through our church. Time and time again, God has taught me that when we stop thinking of ourselves, when we take time to help those around us, we will be capable of even greater things. That's what Jesus said when he left. He said, I'll send you the Holy Spirit and you'll do even greater things than what you saw me do. So there he is. He's riding into town. Some are cheering. Some are plotting his demise. And then look at how our passage ends. And I'm wrapping up. Jesus, in verse 11, says, Jesus entered Jerusalem, went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. He looked around, but left Because it was late. Talk about being anticlimactic. They were cheering for him to take the throne, to break the oppression. The crowd was expecting Jesus to become some type of military king. And maybe bolts of lightning would burst out from his eyes and blast all those that got in his way. But he looked around a little bit and then he just left. He didn't take the throne. At the end of these coronations, the king takes the throne. That's not what he did. That wasn't his way of doing things. Instead of killing his oppressor, he forgave them. And actually, he allowed them to kill him. He would cry out, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus died on a cross a few days later after the triumphal entry. And everyone's bubble burst. Everyone's expectations had been let down. It's as if their candidate that they were sure was going to win in a landslide lost in a landslide. They were crushed. And thank God they were. You see, God had something far greater for them than just becoming an earthly king and defeating a Roman army. That's short-sighted. He wanted much more for their lives than to return to how things used to be under King David. As wonderful as that was, that's so cheap in comparison to what he wanted to give them. Jesus, through his death and resurrection, became the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He defeated death and the grave. That's what he wanted to give them. Instead of returning to the way things were under King David, he wanted to go even further back to the way things were with Adam and Eve in the garden. 
So although their expectations were not met, Jesus was giving them something far beyond anything they could think or imagine. And that is what he wants to give you and to give me. There is going to come a time in our lives when doing things for money or power or titles or houses or things isn't enough. We can only find true fulfillment in doing Jesus things, in loving and serving our neighbor. There's going to come a time in our lives when we realize that a political or other type of leader can't save us. The only one who can is Jesus. And even with me, you know, maybe you were expecting something different. And me here speaking is bursting your bubble. <laughs> trust God. He might be up to something. I trust Pastor Tara. I trust the pastors. I trust the church board, the search committee. And I trust what God has been speaking to me and to Andrea. So I want us to trust in his ways. I want us to lean into serving one another, even and especially those that we disagree with. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. I'm Pastor Tara Van Cross, and we're so glad that you're here as a part of this Azure Hills Church community. Please like and subscribe and click the bell to be notified for when we share new videos. Would you also pray over giving to support this ministry? AzureHills.org backslash give is the place to go. We pray for you regularly that God would continue to move and work in your life.